Welcome, Carlene Sinclair, to 106 Life Factors. We have Carlene because Carlene is in the real estate business in Jamaica. And she's going to explain to us today, especially for those senior citizens in the diaspora that own homes in Jamaica, how to sell your home if you're interested in doing so. And she's also going to break down for us just in layman terms, because Carlene is Jamaican and she knows that that's all we understand information. <laughs> um, the difference between a broker and an agent, because Carlene has been in the business for such a long time, so um, she's taken on a different role. Welcome, Carlene. Thank you for having me. Okay, my name is Carlene Sinclair. I am a real estate broker. I have been in this industry for over 30 years. I am a past president of the Real Deal Association of Jamaica. So I have touched many facets of the industry. Yeah. In fact, I have been in the industry before the Real Estate Dealers and Developers Act, which is the law, the body of law that regulate our industry. Okay. Um, I'm going to speak to selling the property. Or oh, you want me to break down the difference between the realtor associate? And the okay. As far as the real estate laws are concerned, a salesman is an agent. An agent cannot operate on their own. They have to be attached to a dealer slash a broker. So I'll explain the difference. Yes. So at the real estate board, which is our licensing authority, we're classified as salesmen and dealers or agents and dealers. But when we take on the professional part of it now, which is a member of the Realtors Association of Jamaica, Mm -hmm. then we become realtors and realtor associates. The broker is the realtor. The realtor associate is the agent. The agent cannot operate on their own. They must be attached to a dealer. Clear. Broker, broker dealer, agent, realtor associate. All right, that's a difference. Very good. I, well, I did not know that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I thought the terms could be used interchangeably. Now I understand. Thank you. No, no. So, so agents must be attached and they must be supervised by the dealer, dealer broker. And right. so in order to become a broker, then it's another step up. In another terms of set of studies and qualification. And the dealer is the one who owns the broker. Okay. And, and the, the agents are private, are independent contractors who are um, attached but they're not employed for taxation purposes. They're not employed, they're attached because they would classify them as independent contractors so they pay their own taxes and so on. Great, good. Mm -hmm. All right, now that we clear that up, so Carlene Davis, um, Carlene Sinclair, I'm sorry, is a real estate um, broker. Broker. Now, broker. Can, you, can you explain to us for uh, a Jamaican, say, living in the US who owns a home in Jamaica and decided that they want to sell that home. Lead us through this step-by-step -step process, including, you know, probably an estimate cost. Yes. Estimate cost of each step. Because I'm gonna get, I'm gonna be, they're gonna, I'm gonna get those questions. Um, yeah, and, 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 they're, and they and they need to know. They need to know because we find that when we are dealing with international clients, returning residents who are selling. We have to stop and educate first mm -hmm. because they need to understand what are the, the things involved in terms of cost and policies and so on. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, a Jamaican living in the US or anywhere in the world um, wants to sell. Um, the first thing I'd say to that prospective client, always engage a real, a, a real estate practitioner because the process is so tedious and you need guidance. That's why, that's why we're here, right? Um, the, the first thing we want to establish also is whether or not there is a marketable title for the property. Mm. And I say marketable title because a title can have many issues. So it may be a, a, a property that is a subject of a probate. It may be a property that is um, a family, owned by family, and some members may want to sell and some members may not want to sell. It may be a property that is occupied by tenants or what people classify as abandoned because they, the owner is absentee, persons who live there are not paying any rent. So a property can have a range of issues attached to it. And we as the realtor need to establish that because we can't sell a property if there is no marketable title. 
right? So let, so, let, let me ask you this question. So, because you mentioned, I'm thinking, I think I understand all the other parts, but the, you mentioned if it's under probate, meaning mm -hmm. that there's a lien against the property. Is that no. what? Okay. It's so, for example, somebody died mm -hmm. and left it for their children or siblings. You own it. But you're not, you can't sell it unless the probate, you get grant of probate, meaning that the law, you the, the lawyer who's acting for you would have gone through the various processes mm -hmm. to empower you to sell it. You own it because the will speak, the will says you are the beneficiary, but you can't sell unless those steps would have been taken through the court to give you a grant of probate where you can now legally sell it. Please. Okay. Good. Right. So it's just those things. Look, people believe that they're the beneficiary, so I can just one sell. No. The law, you have to engage the law, you know, to probate that will. You so can have the, another question that comes up right there, too. So the 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 person who is interested in selling coming mm -hmm. to you as a broker, can mm -hmm. you will have you will inform this person that they, these, you know, of these conditions. Are you the one now doing this search on these, this title or no, a lawyer will have to do the search on it? Okay, we do searches because we have to make sure that the property we are listing for sale can be sold. Okay. So we have to make sure that we check the title to ensure that the names, the registered owners on the title are the person we are speaking with. Because you could own a property with your sister and you decide you want to sell, and your sister is not selling. So if we see more than one name on it, right. three names, we have to speak to those three persons to, to, um, to ensure that they are on the same page and they're all selling. We can't sell because two persons agree and one person don't agree. They have to all agree. And we have a lot of cases like that where five persons own a property, four want to sell, one not selling. We can't sell. We can't sell that property. Right. And then you have those where the person would have died without leaving a will. So the property is not the subject of um, an estate that must be administered by the administrator general department. And that is a very, very long process because, you know, government agencies and the work pile up and so on. So we always hope that when the property involves a deceased person, that there was a will involved. Because probating a will is much easier than going through the administrat administrator's general department. So let me so ask you. So take it that, that those things are not involved. It's a property that a husband and wife or an individual decides to sell. Mm -hmm. The first thing we want to do is to, we, we check the title to make sure that the person we're speaking with is the owner. We do that. It's no cost. We, we, we have online access to the National Land Agency and we can verify that information. Mm -hmm. So we, the, the first thing we want to establish, do you know the value of your property? The estimated market value, what are we gonna sell it for? Oftentimes what person want for the property in their head is not what the reality is on the ground. Sometimes it is overinflated, you know, in terms of your expectation. Right. Uh, but because we're in a seller's market now, we we see that your expectation is close to what we're getting for and sometimes even surpass that mm -hmm. because if we get multiple offers, you're going to get more than you listed for. Mm -hmm. So what the realtor does, the realtor is going to guide you as to how to arrive at the estimated market value that is fitting for the market. Question so right here. Can, mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question right here. So the fact that, yes, you know, possibly the market range in terms of price, Mm -hmm. Do you, would you encourage the person as a broker to have the property appraised first? Yes, absolutely. That's what I was about to say now. Mm -hmm. We would recommend that you do a valuation report. Mm -hmm. We would also check those because we have statistics. We have data available to us through um, our MLS. We can go back and check what a property in that area with similar size and age and so on is sold for or can be sold for. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this, that and, and the valuers are doing a, a super job, but they have to work with the realtors because the realtors are in the market. So if you're looking at estimated market value, the value is using a set of 
um, a set of tool, a tool that will compare and look at what the stamp office data says and so on, what they have to also use what the realtors have, what is currently on the market, what is currently under offer, how long does it take for us to get it on a contract? Because we can list something for 100 million, but it's on the market for two years and it's not been sold. So we can't use that, right? We could list something for 100 million and eventually we got it sold for 40 million. 40 million is a real price mm -hmm. because that's what a ready, willing and able buyer mm -hmm. is paying for that property at this time, mm -hmm. right? So we, we see the range of expectations. So having arrived at the sale price, whether by an independent valuation report, which we will recommend that you do, a lot of sellers don't have the money to pay for a report. We recommend it, but they will say to us, I don't have that money up front to pay for a report. How else can I get the price? We will do a search on the MLS and we give them examples. We email them a list of properties in that area that are sold recently and what they're sold for. And we will have discussions and we arrive at a price. Um, and we work with that price. And I'm saying if it is, mm -hmm. that is a hot property, it's going to get multiple offers. And a new value might be established now because... For example, I list a house in Havendale for 22 million and I end up getting 34 million. Wow. And it was sold within two days. That's excellent. Yeah, I list a property in Cherry Gardens a couple of weeks ago for 60 million. I ended up getting 75 million in three days. So 60 million is what we saw when we did our comps. Mm -hmm. What persons saw potential in the house that they were willing to pay 75 million for this house. So a new market value has been established. Yeah. Even the value would be saying, wow, really? You know, but because the market is so dynamic, mm -hmm. a value is really given an opinion at this time. Mm -hmm. And it's one man's opinion. I mean, market is use, he or she is using the, the data and the tool to do the research, right? But it's not set incident. So the person is overseas then and say, for example, they reach out to you and say, I have this property and you go through all that process, the title is clean. And they say, you know, and as you said, they have their idea what they would like to sell it for, or they do not have any idea, but you proposed um, a value for it. And you're saying if they don't have the money, you're just doing that proposed idea until a seller actually comes on the market. Yeah, we would just recommend. We are only recommending, you know, the seller still has the right to decide and it's the seller's duty to decide what to sell it for. We're only guiding. Mm -hmm. You, as I say, well, the last property sold in Havendale, for example, would be 32 million, same half acre, all the type, no, free, you know. So we give you those information and you decide. What to sell it for, but we're not going to take a listing that it, we know it's unrealistic for us to sell right. for that particular price, you know, because the really and truly the market is what determines the price. It is the market so, that determines the price. So, when you do have one of those overly, um, what's the word? When you have a, 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 a potential client that says, No, I'm not budging on this price, this is what I want for this property, and no less unless it's more. And you say it's unrealistic. Do you kind of continue with that client because you want to satisfy the client mind and, and kind of show well, them how it evolves? Okay. Yes, yeah, so we, we will continue with the client because when we take a property, when we take a listing, when we sign a contract to sell your house, mm -hmm. right? But here's a contract that we'll sign to sell your house. Um, it's on the it goes on the MLS. And and I only take MLS listings. Because I believe that the seller has the right to enjoy the maximum coverage, right? So our, our listings, for example, is populated on all the realtors' website in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And it goes on realtor.com international because we are members of the realtor.com. Uh, we're, we're members of NAR and NAR owns realtor.com. So the international sites are over 80 members. So our listings in Jamaica, when we list a property, it goes, it's populated on over 80 international sites in the different currencies and languages. So the property is just getting this exposure that no seller can pay for. 
So you're talking about your your or your um company specific yes. any listing I take, it's populated on all the realtors website in Jamaica as well as regular company. Car Carleen, did you state the name of your realtor by the way? What's my the company property solutions? Oh, yeah. property solutions. So my question is. When you say it's if you post on the MLS website, is it are you're just speaking particular to your um, agency? Yes, all our all the realtors in Jamaica are mem who are members of the Realtor Association of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. we, we have a co we have a we have an agreement with each other. Okay, that once we list on that platform, the system okay. automatically populates. So my listings will be on Remax. Um, Keller Williams, Coral Banker. Okay. Their listings are on my website. Any website, it's so easy for a buyer to navigate. Got that it. if you want, all you need to do is choose which realtor you're working with because any website you want in Jamaica, the same properties are going to be on it. Okay. No, you don't have to be jumping from property solutions to Remax to Keller Williams. You just choose your realtor that you feel comfortable working with. And I believe that is serving the clients, the, the external yeah. clients, the sellers and the buyers better. Um, I'm not being selfish. We're not being selfish anymore. We're, we're looking for the, the benefits that we can give to our clients. Okay. So you look at the title in terms of property, you look at the, 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 the approximate cost for the property. What would be the next step? We list it and we start getting offers. So this is where it comes now. This is where the crunch comes in. If it is that we have a property that is listed for a price that we feel is was overpriced. We have to, we give reports to the seller. We must give these reports to the seller so we can, we can track every listing and we can see within the first week how many persons see that listing online. Ah. Mm -hmm. We can see how many agents have looked at it and have emailed it out to their prospective buyers. We can see, we can give the seller a, a report as to how many showings we have over a month period. Mm -hmm. And if there's any offer, what those offers are, our obligation and duty is to submit all offers to the seller, whether it makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. So even if it's a, what we consider a very low offer, even though we know the seller may not or will not entertain it, our duty is still to submit it because that is how you're gonna be educated as to really what people are saying about your property. Right. And it will help us to make decisions. So after five months, we would have had that listings, for example, and we have no offers that would look anywhere close to the list price. We could go back to that seller and say, this is what we're getting. Now, it depends on how serious that seller is, because we do have sellers who are not under any pressure to sell. Mm -hmm. And we have sellers who are under pressure to sell, depending on their circumstances. Mm -hmm. If a seller is under pressure to sell and must sell and don't really have much time to waste, Mm -hmm. They'll say, look, okay, I list something for 50 million, but you're only getting 35. Let me lower the price to 40. Let us see if we can negotiate something in here because I want to sell. Mm -hmm. Some sellers may say, I don't really want to sell right now. Let's stay for another year and see what will come up. Wow. What, yeah, we have sellers like that. Who is, we're frustrated, yes, because we're, <laughs> we're not here to sit down on a property for a year. Right. But if that's what the seller wants, we'll, we'll renew the listing and we'll keep it there. But mm -hmm. And we'll keep giving the reports to the seller. So we have different sellers. People are selling for different reasons, right? And I always tell clients about the time value of money, right? If you really want to sell, the money is, um, what the money is worth to you now. And was it, what is it, what is the worth of that money to you three months later? Right. And yeah, it helped you to make that decision. Question here. So from mm -hmm. that beginning uh, process, when the potential seller calls, is there any money exchange between the seller, the potential seller and the agent or broker? Absolutely not. And that is our a commission. Yes, our commission is paid at the completion, right? Mm -hmm. So let me break down the closing cost. The government transfer tax is currently 2% of the sale mm -hmm. price. The seller pays that on his or, or, or her own, right? Mm -hmm. The seller, that's a seller's cost. Then purchasers don't share that cost. There is stamp duty. Stamp duty was reduced to a very, very 
nominal amount. I think it's 5,000 something Jamaican dollars. Mm -hmm. it's, it used to be based on a percentage of the sale price. I think 4% the last time it was reduced to $5,000. And that is shared equally. Um, registration fees. Between the seller and the buyer. Seller and buyer, So right. there's the, the, the real estate fees, then the stamp duty fees. But so let, let's deal with the government duties first. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So the government duties that are involved in a transaction for the seller would be the transfer tax of 2%. Mm -hmm. Half of the stamp duty, which is the stamp duty, the full stamp duty is $5,000. So the buyer pays two five, the seller pays two five, right? Mm -hmm. The registration fee is 0.5% of the sale price. Buyer pays half, seller pays half. So we have three government um, expenses that must be paid in a transaction, which is a transfer tax if for the seller, stamp mm -hmm. duty and registration, those three things, all right? Then we'll move on to the attorney's fee. Mm -hmm. Each party pay their attorney, right? So the seller will pay the attorney that they engage to do the carriage of sale. The buyer will pay their, their attorney who is representing them in the transaction. And I always recommend that you must have an attorney. Well, the seller must have one and the buyer must have one, right? Um, they... The seller would have paid for a valuation report if they choose to do one upfront. They would have done that when we're pricing the place, right? Right. Um, so, so there is no cost. All the costs are paid for the seller. All the costs are paid when the sale is closed legally. So when the proceeds are so paid. Even it, even if they're, I'm sorry, I, 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 could you repeat what you said? Sorry. All the costs are paid when the sale is closed. Mm -hmm. So you ask me how come how come they're able to pay the transfer tax and the stamp duty, which is in the process of the sale before disclosed? Right. Those are paid from the deposit that the buyer would have paid. Okay. Right. Now oh, that makes sense. Okay. So the buyer now, that potential buyer showing interest in the property. Now, you know, this is when everything starts kicking into gear where they have to pay that. How much percentage is it that they have to put down? All right. So given that, they say, let's say the offer was accepted. Mm -hmm. But we can't get a transaction unless an offer was accepted. Proposed. Right? Accepted. Okay. Right. So an offer was made and the offer is accepted. Buyer and seller, now we have a thing. We would instruct the seller's attorney to prepare the agreement of sale. We now take it that the agreement is signed by both parties. At that time is when the buyer pays the deposit. Mm -hmm. Buyer don't pay a deposit before that. We don't take we don't take what you call initial deposit and we don't deal with those things. And we don't collect money here. Realtors do not collect money. The money, the deposit is paid to the seller's attorney, who is a legal agent for the seller. Right? Yeah. And the seller's attorney has the power to pay the, the transfer tax and stamp duties from the deposit to get the sale concluded. Because remember that if the buyer is getting financing, that amount that is being financed is not gonna be paid over until the title is transferred in the buyer's name. Okay, so can you hold that for a second? Mm -hmm. First of all, can you clarify how much does the sell, what is the, the deposit? If the seller went down. Deposit can be five percent now. Could you repeat that? Deposit a deposit a buyer's deposit can be five percent. Five percent, and you're it saying can be 5 it's not exchanged between agents or broker. It is ex the money is sent directly to the lawyer. The seller's attorney, right. right? So some buyer, some buyer might say, "I'll pay my attorney my deposit." That's a choice they have, but that buyer's attorney has to pay that money over to the seller's attorney eventually when the, when the contract is signed. What do you recommend just to be safe? Because we know there's some horror stories going on. So what do you recommend if you're working with a client overseas that the transaction is usually through for telecommunications, right? Mm -hmm. So they said, do they send the money to the broker or the agent to turn to the attorney or directly to the attorney just so the paper? I would say, you see, you don't want, we don't want to, to waste time with money going to a realtor and then you have to wait until a check is cleared or the funds are available to send it to a lawyer. 
I choose, and many brokers choose not to collect money. There's an expense in collecting money. It's not our money. It has no meaning to us. It serves no useful purpose. Mm -hmm. More than it, more administrative bungling and cost to money passing through your account and you have to monitor that. So we choose not to. That's not our business. We need to go and sell a property. So we will say to the buyer, if you want, you pay your deposit to, the, to your attorney. And your attorney pay, because I can't tell a buyer not to pay the money to your attorney. I'd be out of order to do that, mm -hmm. right? Is who you trust and how you want to deal with the transaction. But, and that buyer's attorney know that once their client, the buyer, signs the contract, they must send that deposit over with the signed agreement. The seller is not going to sign until that deposit is with the seller's attorney. Right? So you're selling. Your lawyer is not going to let you put the ink on the paper unless I say, as your lawyer, I've, I have the deposit. Go ahead and sign. Got it. Right? Mm -hmm. Because a contract without the money being paid is just a piece of paper. There's no consideration. One of the elements of a contract, a binding contract, is that the deposit, the consideration must be paid, which is a deposit. Right? So taking that the deposit is paid and it is 5%. And I'll tell you why it is 5%. It is 5% because 5% is more than adequate to pay the transfer tax of 2%, mm -hmm. to pay the registration fee and the stamp duties to facilitate the transfer of the title. That's why it is 5%. Before the government reduced the transfer tax and stamp duties to what it is now, the deposit would have been 10 mm -hmm. because the lawyer would, have, would not have enough money to complete mm -hmm. the transaction, to, to do that, those expenses. That mm -hmm. needs to be paid to bring the sale, the title in the name of the buyer. Sounds interesting. Claire? What about, um, I'm thinking general consumption tax comes somewhere in there. Is it also? Yes. And we, okay, so we didn't finish with cost. So the seller pays the commission, mm -hmm. which is 5% plus GCT. Okay. General consumption tax is, uh, it is paid on goods and services. So realtors provide a service. So the government requires us to collect the GCT once we are registered to collect it. Not all realtors are registered mm -hmm. to collect GCT, right? Oh. So currently the government will say, if you're not earning, if our income is not 10 million and more, you're not registered to collect GCT. If our income is more than 10 million, we are registered to collect GCT and we must collect the GCT. If we don't collect it, we have to pay it. So the so seller like, has to pay all the, the commission. Because when we do the invoice, it will say whatever the commission is and the GCT and the lawyer. So the lawyer for the seller is doing all the payouts mm -hmm. and they will do a final statement to the seller to show how they arrive at the net proceeds of this transaction. Mm -hmm. So it will show the sale price show how much for transfer tax and stamp duties and all those things that were paid. Mm -hmm. It will show whether or not he paid property taxes because you would have to pay up those up to the point when the buyer becomes the owner. Mm -hmm. It would show, if it's an apartment, you'll show you pay up the, the um, strata fees but you'll be HOA fee, you know them as in, right. in the US, but here we call them maintenance, maintenance strata fees. So you'll pay up the strata fees as well water bill water runs with the land so all the water bill up to the point when the title was transferred the lawyer has to pay up the water bill as well so all of those things would have been paid out of the proceeds and the commission and and all of those things and then they arrive at the net proceeds that the seller gets so no seller should have a sale close get money and don't understand from his or her attorney how they arrive at this money right, right. you know they must get a closing statement. I've had a lot of sellers call me and say, I get 10 million, but I sold a place for 13. I said, what, where is your closing statement? You should have gotten one from the lawyer to show right. you how you are, how the lawyer arrived at the 10 million you, you now got. Right. So they must insist on getting a closing statement from their attorney. So the seller, in terms of having the... the the awareness of the process as it unfolds. That means there's a lot of communication 
um, mm -hmm. in between, whether by email or phone calls. Say for those people who, you know, long distance, not everybody's using WhatsApp or, you know, other kind of, um, you know, video, audio technology. Do they have to also pay for these phone calls in terms of communications? Yeah. Um, I can speak for my brokerage. Uh, we don't charge for telephone call, and I hate WhatsApp. I prefer to call it straight. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I entertain WhatsApp call from my overseas friends because I understand, you know, the right. cost for communication. And I love emails because it's, it sets things straight, you know. And there is record keeping with emails and so on. And you need to know mm -hmm. what you said to the person. The person can have record of what you said and all of that. Mm -hmm. But we don't charge. We just charge our commission. We don't charge for any extra work. We don't charge to inspect your property. We don't charge if we have to go to the title's office and pull a copy of your title. We don't charge if we have to um, assist you, especially overseas clients. They need somebody here sometimes to get things done. I have had to go to the tax office to find out how much tax you owe. Right. You have to pay the taxes. I've had to go to the water commission to get your last water bill, but a lawyer is not going to do it really. Um, so we would have to do a lot of legwork for our overseas clients, and we don't charge for it. It's free. Um, we, we consider that it's already included in our commission markets, not what the commission is supposed to be. But no, we wouldn't be getting down to doing those things and charge you for a telephone call or so, so mailing you a letter or sending you something by courier. No, we, we don't do that. No. Let's be realistic, because that's a very good point that you made, because one of the things that came up was um, people who do not have anyone, not, they will say, well, I have a hundred relatives, but I cannot trust any of them to do any of these things. I, yeah, I've, I've known of people who actually, like, you know, to send the money, okay, to clear up the water bill, but it never happened or send money to pay the taxes, even though, you know, it's good that the tax office now is doing the online thing where you can pay online. So you're saying that there's a lot of work put in by the agent slash broker but yet there's no extra cost except that you said two and a half percent? We've charged five percent, five percent from five percent. Um, and, and that's it. Wow, mm -hmm. that that's that, that's pretty interesting, actually. Yeah. Yes, because um we know that it's not easy. We I'll tell you something, that, we go even further because if you have tenants there, mm -hmm, right, even though you notice sometimes for you to serve on your tenant to, to let them know. You know, because the lawyer is going to charge you extra and the lawyer should. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I suspect if you have to go to court to get a mortgage, the lawyer will do it. But we, a lot of little things that we'll have to do, but it all comes down to the resourcefulness of the realtor involved in okay. the transaction. Because mm -hmm. I may not need to be, I don't, probably don't need to move from my desk to get it done. I can send an email to the, the person who deals with the bill, billing at Water Commission and get them to pull that and send right. it to me. I could call, I could contact the tax office and have them email me your amount outstanding and I forward it to you. So it's the resourcefulness. I don't have to, to drive and park and go into the tax office necessarily, but, but we'll get it done. We know what needs to be done. In fact, we help you to get it done because if we don't get it done, we're going to wait too long to get our commission. Right. So we're going to jump on that and do all that is required to get it done as fast as possible because we want that sale to close. So all things are perfect. And it's going smoothly where it's a clear title. Um, the title search came back, you know, positive. And um, you will do the listing, you do all the paperwork, a buyer shows interest, and all these things. The buyer um, put down yeah, that 5%. And so there's enough money to cover those stamp duties and all those things that needs to be done to get the process going. So you're in the mm -hmm. waiting process. What else should be the seller? What what else the seller should be doing at this time, or the agent doing for the seller during, um, you know, the whole unfolding of the administrative process? Okay, so the the transaction process usually, well, in Jamaica, once there is a lender involved, the contract would say a completion time of say ninety days. That's the average time. Wow, ninety days. Mm -hmm. 90 sometimes days. the buyer's attorney, 90, I'm not going to explain why it is 90 days. Um, sometimes the buyer's attorney will ask for 120 days. So we're looking at between three to four months for the sale to close. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to explain what caused some of these, why, why the lawyer asked for 90 days. The lender is going to need six weeks to process that loan. 
Six weeks, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, in that six weeks, remember, once the agreement is signed by both parties, right? Mm -hmm. The buyer now needs to get into the lender to make a formal application because we would have gotten what you call a prequel. Mm -hmm. We don't submit any offer to any seller without seeing a prequel for the prospective buyer that you are pre-qualified for X, but that's a prequel. We're now in a contract signed and we're ready to do the application for the loan. When we do the, the buyer has to do a valuation for the lender. Sometimes that valuation, that value, the value might take a week or two. We have to do a service ID report. I like to coordinate both so we get them done one time, right? So they have to provide these things depending on the property. Now, suppose there's a breach of any of the covenants, the fence not aligned properly, properly, the house eve hanging over too close to the fence, whatever. We have to address that right away because the lender is not going to approve a loan that has a breach that we don't fix. There are many ways to fix a breach anyway. Um, they can be fixed by people, but not necessarily physically. Mm -hmm. So, so once the lender uh, give the letter of undertaking, while that is happening simultaneously, the stamp office, the, the lawyer has to submit that signed agreement to the stamp office for what you call assessment. This is a government stamp office. Mm -hmm. It can take up three to four weeks at the government stamp office for assessment because the government stamp office will send an, one of their values to also look at the property to see whether or not the agreed sale price in the contract, say we're selling something for 20 million in the contract, if they think it's valued for more. But is this always the case? If, if say for example, because the initial evaluator would be a private contractor, yes? Right, doing it for the value. Right, and say when this actually, it, the paperwork is submitted to the government office, you're saying that unless there's a, if there's a breach, then the government will send out their own contractors or- No, the bridge is separate, no. Let's not, let's, let's take the bridge out for now. I'm gonna explain the bridge. So okay. let's say we're dealing with a lender. The lender is taking six weeks to give the letter of undertaking. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. You say the loan is properly approved. Thing. But while that lender is processing the loan, the seller's attorney has to send the signed agreement to the government stamp office for assessment. Okay. What they're doing there is to, they need to ensure that the property is worth the 20 and not more. Because if they think it's worth more, they're going to assess the stamp duties at what they feel okay. the property okay. is worth. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a situation where we're selling something for 20, for example, and the stamp, the government thinks it worth 22. They're going to assess the duties on 22. What that means is that Either the seller or the buyer will have to pick up the difference in some duties here, Got it. right? Okay, yes. right. So, so the government stamp office is taking up about three to four weeks to do that assessment and get back to the attorney to say, we, we approve the, the value, the sale price, and tell them what the duties are to go and pay mm -hmm. while the lender is processing. So two things are happening in the transaction when us sitting down. While that is happening, the agent, the realtor involved, is gone to the, the tax office to get the certificate of payment of taxes. And I'll tell you why a certificate. The seller could have paid up the last five years of property tax, but they owe tax 10 years beyond. So what a tax office is doing is run a check on the property for way back and to ensure that there's no outstanding property tax, no gap, all the years have been paid. Right. and give a certificate of payment of taxes. Right. We do the same for water. We just get the final water bill. And so we're doing all of that. If the property is tenanted, then we also have to start making the tenant or the occupant be aware that the property is being sold. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes serve, get a notice served on them, you know, right. because we don't want the sale to be closed and we can't get them out. Right. Okay. right. It is a seller's responsibility to give vacant possession and completion to the buyer. Mm -hmm. All of this is happening and we have to get them done in 90 days, right? To get a tenant out of a house in 90 days, kind of rough because if we go to court, the judge is going to give them extra time. So we have to get the seller involved depending on who the tenant is. Some tenants cooperate, some really carry through the court. 
right? So, so given all of that is done, once the, mm -hmm. once the seller's attorney gets the letter on the table, he's now gonna go and get the property transferred in the buyer's name. So the documents are stamped and the duties are paid and we'll go to the title's office and the registrar of title will effect the transfer on the title. Then the title goes to the lender and the lender pays out the proceeds to the seller's attorney, right? Mm -hmm. And that is how the sale closed. Now, when we get when the seller's attorney gets the money and money is transferred now electronically, so we don't have to wait until check clear anymore. Everything is RTGS, wire transfer. The lawyer gets the money. The lawyer sits down now and prepare the closing statement. We send our invoice over because we would know that the sale is closed. Right. If we're involved, right? Mm -hmm. And the lawyer is paying out everybody to do the statement. And at that point, now the, the seller will have to provide their bank details to the attorney so that they can get their money wired to their Quest, account. Question. So the seller is overseas. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that the money can be wired directly from yes. Jamaica to overseas to a US? Yes, country? absolutely. Absolutely. But there's something that we haven't spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, due diligence and the anti-money laundering regulations and the right. Terrorism Prevention Act. That's because what we're thinking really, about. Right. Yes. So every client, because even before I take the listing, I would have sent a set of documents to the seller to fill out. Because know your customer, I have to know my customer. Right. So I'll have to get a copy of the title, get your ID, proof of address, your TRN, all of that, and your bank information. I don't need your bank information. You know, I would have gotten that. And if the client does not have a TRN, because some may not, you know, they haven't visited Jamaica for a very long time, they have, there's no need for having a, a Jamaican driver's license or um, a Jamaican TRN. Um, one of the concerns is people say that they're being asked for their U.S. social security number and driver's license. Is that the case? And they're, they're, they're concerned that, no, it's not going to happen because they're not giving up their information. In that. All right. I don't know that we ask people for their social security number. We don't. Mm -hmm. um, but every person who is conducting business in Jamaica must have a TRN. That's the law. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take long to get one. You can stay and apply on the tax office portal, portal for a TRN. Okay. And you are given a piece of paper. In fact, the lawyer who is representing the seller can also make an application for the TRN. Even at that point, even before I take a listing, I need your TRN. Okay. So at that point, because I have to do that set of documents, um, the CIF, it requires a copy of your ID, your TRN, and your proof of address. Three things. So okay. you must have a TRN. Which address? The address in Jamaica for the property? The address where you're living. Oh, in the U.S., okay. In the U.S., wherever you live. Uh -huh. we, we In Jamaica, the law allow us to accept your U.S. driver's license as proof of address. Okay. Because we know in the U.S., if you remove from where you're living, you have to notify the, the DM, the driver's license people within 10 days of your new address. Mm -hmm. So because that law exists in the United States, we can, our law allows us to mm -hmm. take your, your driver's license as your proof of address, right? Here in Jamaica, our voter ID is accepted as proof of address, not your driver's license. Mm -hmm. Because you could have a driver's license for 10 years and you're moving all over the place and there's no law requiring you to change your address on your driver's license. Okay, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. so we don't accept it. So we have to see that the address you gave us as your address that you actually live at that address. Mm -hmm. But the TRN is no issue to get at all. It's very, very easy. And everybody, it doesn't matter if you're from China, Japan, mm -hmm. wherever you come from, you must have a TRN. Okay. And buying or selling or renting. Buying or, okay. And mm -hmm. what about this thing about having every copy of your ID notarized? Notarized? Yes. In order to say, again, the seller is overseas. Canada, mm -hmm. US, England, wherever. And you're required, they're selling their property in Jamaica. 
and you're, the agent is requiring that, okay, send me copies of these. However, these must be notarized. Yes. It's a good question. It's a, it's a valid request. Mm -hmm. It's a valid request because we are in the age where um, we, can, we, can, we can modify documents. Okay. We're, we're at computer age where documents can be modified. And because the onus is on the realtors and the attorneys to make sure we get, Mark, we're not investigators, but mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we do our best to make sure that the documentation that we are asking for are we, 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 we go beyond the call of duty. We don't take anything. We don't, we don't ask for this for a copy and send a picture of your ID. In fact, the lawyer will go further and I will go further. I'll say, I need a, the seal for the notary public. The notary who, because you can have a notary whose certificate expired. Yeah, I so know. Okay. sometimes I think for the seller, for the clients overseas, they believe that we're giving them a hard time. <laughs> and I'm happy for the opportunity to say to them, we're not giving you a hard time because if we fail to ask you for proper documentation, we can go to prison. It's $1 million fine or imprisonment for us as realtors if we deal with somebody who is in, for example, suppose we sold a house and everything went through and closed and we believe we got good documents. And the FID calls me and says, Miss Sinclair, we need to get the file for whatever property. And I'm coming to your office to look at the file. And the, now they found out that the property is involved with a drug dealer or there are something wrong with the client who I dealt with and I didn't get proper information or the person who gave who I dealt with is not even the legal owner. He doctored his documents, right? And I didn't show that I got anything notarized. I didn't, you know, I'm going to be in problems. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I know I'm on a Zoom. We had a close one the other day where we actually ended oh, wow. up in a signed agreement signed agreement the father and the son has the same name same name so the son listed the property for sale we got his id in name so name is on the title that name is on the title that name is on the id we got everything the lawyer was also satisfied that this is the owner of the property we're dealing with until the father showed up and said, I'm not selling my property. What could you have done differently in that, the fact that the name is? You know, <laughs> we, it's hard. It, well, they, both of them have the same name. But mm -hmm. one of the things we could have done is to look at the date when the person became the owner. Uh, and and then, look at the age of the person. Uh -huh. And we would have seen, but that's what, we had to look at it and said, this person owned this house in 1958. You weren't even born based on your ID that you gave us. So there are so many pieces to, yes. to, to so look at. So sometimes it looks like we're, we're really giving you a hard time. We're not giving you a hard time. We have to make sure mm -hmm. that we're dealing with the bona fide legal owners of the property, that when we list it for sale, we're not going to have issues, that when we actually engage buyer and seller together, we're still good. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what we have to do. So when we ask you to get it notarized and we ask for a copy of the notary public seal, um, it's not our certificate. We're not, we're not being difficult. Yes. You, mm -hmm. I know you were going to say, I don't know if you finished what you were planning to say about money laundering when you were asking. Money laundering, right. So yeah. since um, about five years ago, realtors are what you call non-financial, we're non-financial institutions, no way? Mm -hmm. um, so the same way a bank would ask you for these know your customer forms and the due diligence, we as realtors have to do that to every one of our clients, the ones who are renting, buying, selling, doesn't matter what. Mm -hmm. And so there's a customer information form, we ask for all of these things, proof of funds. So if somebody is coming to us to buy something cash, mm -hmm. we have to see that the fund, they have the funds in their name. Right. And, so and, for, and for a period of time too, right? 
Um, yeah. Not like for me, I don't need to know that they have it. We need to know that the money is in your name because we don't want to know that um, Sonia comes, made us an offer to buy a property, but the money is in Sonia's mother's name or Sonia auntie's name. Right. In other words, you, you might be facilitating a transaction on behalf of somebody. We want to know that Sonia is the client. Sonia has the money in her account. Right. Sonia lives where she says she lives. <laughs> she is the person we're looking at. Right. And that's the person we're doing the transaction with. Mm -hmm. Because people will front transaction for others who are not in a place where they can come up front and do a transaction. They don't have what it takes. And so we have to make sure we answer the proof of funds for a buyer. And we see that they are coming and saying, the money is in my auntie name. I said, no, your money, the money must be in your name. Mm -hmm. You must get a bank statement showing, I don't care if it's yesterday, get the money, but you must come to me because once the, once you go through the formal banking system, I'm good. You know, matter if it's yesterday, do it. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Because you could have sold some stocks and put the money in your account this morning. You know, whatever it is that you're doing, right. I don't care. But you show me something that you have the money in your name and the address that you are with your address to, right? So we know where you're dealing with you. So the and most likely the bank would be able to issue an official financial letter. Yes, ma'am. So yes. what we do, we ask them to get a letter from the bank or, or the last bank statement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they log online and there's a screenshot of their bank account. We see that it's them. You know, we, we have ways of determining that this is the person and this is their account. We don't need your account number. We don't need all of that um, confidential information. We just need to see your name, that it is an official bank. Mm -hmm. and that the money is there so you're so so carly you're you're talking to a seller from overseas and you know she has not been to jamaica say in the last 20 25 years she have little clue as to major changes going on in jamaica but she does have a home she knows that the home exists there she has a relative who, who looks at the home and so on and she's ready to sell Tell this seller out of one to 10, a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most difficult, how difficult the process is in terms of um, getting through it. I know you mentioned 90 days, but we've heard that even when all health is equal, meaning everything is okay, it can take up to a year or even more. So can you not tell for, us not for the sale, not for the sale to close, but to find a buyer if the price is not right. I say to clients all the time, if the price is right, there is a buyer within a short time. Okay. Usually when a property stays on the market and just wallow like that, it's because the price is just not right. It's priced outside of the market. So one to ten, how difficult is the process in terms of waiting, the waiting process and getting the paperwork done? <laughs> <laughs> you see, it is not a it's not a one to ten answer, Sonia, because it depends. All right, it depends on the issue. What issues are there? Issues? What are the issues? How easy it is to resolve those issues? For example, suppose we, every property is different. You know, every 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 transaction is different. There's no two that are so similar. If the seller is if I'm selling a property that has bridge, for example, and there are bridge that needs to be, cannot be done on paper, cannot be modified on paper. Let's, for example, you, let me see. They add on to the house without any approval. Ah. Right? The house was modified and improved without any approval. And it is in breach because it built too close to the boundary. It may have several breaches. It, the eave hanging over the fence. It too close on the sidewalk. The gate opens up when it should open in. When the survey go down, point out these things. It, there are physical adjustments that need to be done to the property for the sale to close. Sometimes we have to, the seller has to get somebody to go and take down the fence and bring it in, fix it. Oh, and that sounds be, difficult. That sounds yes. Yeah. So, so in those cases, yes, you have. It's difficult, but I would say the average transaction is smooth. The average transaction for an overseas seller who has a good attorney, is he focusing on, there are some elements that once they're in place, a good realtor and a good attorney involved in a transaction, the seller should be easy. 
and the sale will close on time. So let me ask you, so would you encourage then a potential seller to have at least some savings um, um, stored up in, in just in case when they're planning with the, 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 the selling process, certain expenses um, comes up and they have to take care of it in order to move on. So they need to have some money um, stored up in order to do those things. Because if you're mentioning breaches that, you know, as I said, say in the, in the scenario where this woman hasn't been to Jamaica in several years and she's just thinking that, well, I can just keep building on my home wherever and whenever I can. Um, would that be one of the most major advice then that you'd give, having at least some money? Not really. Um, I, I just say not really because it's, it's not every transaction going to have all these breaches and problems. So I wouldn't make a general statement to say, have some money saved. Usually the lawyer is able to even finance some of these from the sale proceeds, depending on how creative the attorney is and how we can pay for some, you know, some okay. items out of it. And there are some, there are one or two properties that cannot be sold unless it's a cash buyer. What we do, for example, suppose that property with all the breaches, the lender is not going to lend it. And the seller may not have the money. And it may not be possible to lick down the top floor right. to make it into a single family. It already exists. What we'll have to do is sell the property as is to a cash buyer. But would it be approved though by... Yes, oh, because yes. if you're buying something okay. cash, you don't... Cash, cash. Remember, it's a lender who's giving the trouble, you know. The lender right. not going to lend if there are breaches. But if I'm selling my home... Makes sense. Full of breach. I just did one in Clarendon. It's full of some of breach. I said, I know when I listed it. I went and looked at the place. I said, it. I said to the seller, you have some breach, cannot be fixed. Because even the neighbor is breaching on your land with a concrete structure. <laughs> let us sell this place as is and let us go for a cash buyer. It means because we're limiting our market to a cash buyer, because you're not widening the market to people who are getting loans. Right. You're limiting your market to a cash buyer. Understand that we won't be able to get 12 million. We're going to stick with 10 or 9. Got we it. have breach. We're not be able to fix them. And we got a cash buyer and he didn't care about the breach. Mm -hmm. He didn't care. He got something for 9 and he wants a property. In fact, he's not going to fix anything. He wants it as it is. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we sell it for what we can get for it. And, and that's okay. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. And that's okay. Uh, what are the, if in terms of selling, without breach or without breaches, um, is there a difference between rural and city where the location of the home is or the property that is? Because it could be commercial building as well, um, or even land. Is there a difference between what is happening? Because you know, you mentioned something about somebody putting up a structure and they did not have it approved by the the, the town. The Mm -hmm. by, by the parish council, for example. And we know that there's a lot of that in Jamaica. Holy, especially in Portmore. <laughs> 90% in Portmore. <laughs> right. So what, is there some penalty for the, the home owner through the parish council? There should be some penalty. There should be, but I, I don't think, you see, our, our regulators are not as spooky as on top of their game as they should. <laughs> so... Yeah, things fall through the cracks. Um, things fall through the cracks. Carly, we, we, we talk a lot and um, I've learned a lot too. And I think we covered, uh, do you think we've covered all the bases for a seller to, if they watch this video and they said, okay, I, do you think they have enough information to, to make a decision to move forward and say, okay, I think I have a clearer picture of selling my property? What, um, what did we miss? I would say they have, good information i wouldn't say they have all the information because okay. each person will have different needs um the, as i said the first thing you reach out to a realtor because everybody will you know each person who wants to sell may have different circumstances mm -hmm. right you may end up if you're absent from the property for over 20 30 years you may not be collecting rent you know there are a lot of stuff you probably want to sit down and discuss with the realtor before we even reach listing it, to we'll work out how we're going to proceed, strategize, you know, how and how we're going to go about what is the approach we're going to take. So I wouldn't say I have all the answers now in this, doing this video um, for everybody. Um, okay. It's not one size fits all. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I think generally, I would have covered the process of the transaction. I would have covered the cost involved in selling. I would have covered um, some of the expectations. Right. Um, but I, I know everybody will have different set of questions, but reach out to a realtor and, and ask these questions. And once you're satisfied, and uh, I say re realtor all the time because I know one of the reasons why we have the law, the real estate dealers and developers acting because persons were really ripping off overseas sellers and buyers, yeah. collecting their money, not paying it over to them. And you ask a very important question, when the sale is closed, can the seller get their money wherever they are in the world? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Money is wired internationally to their account. And that is why we need to establish that the seller has formal banking arrangement anywhere you are in the world. So that the seller, your money can reach you. And Another thing too, and, it's, and the seller's attorney has to make sure whoever they're paying that money to is the seller the person who owned the house. So in other words, I saw a case recently where um, the seller didn't have, the seller was an old lady and she kept saying she using her daughter bank account. And the lawyer was very uncomfortable and rightly so, paying over that same proceeds to the daughter's account. Because you don't know, we don't know if the one is ever gonna reach that lady mm -hmm. who is really the seller who should have the money, even though it's her daughter. Mm -hmm. And so what we had to en encourage is if it is that your daughter is close to you and you don't have, get your name on their, you know, get, get, go to the bank and open an account. Right. Go to the bank and open an account because the, the, the lawyer has a duty to ensure that the, at the end of the day, the funds reach the person who is the legal seller of the property and not to a relative because that lawyer could get in trouble. Because if that seller turns up next year and say, I didn't get my money, I didn't get it, you didn't send yeah. it to me. Yes. That lawyer is gonna have problems and lose their license to practice. So sometimes when the lawyers and the relevant are insisting on certain things, there are valid reasons mm -hmm. because we're also protecting you, the client. Do you have real estate um, agency that are uh, what is the word? Holistic, meaning they have every single, they have the lawyer in-house, they have all sorts of, um, maybe even a paralegal in-house. And is that the best way to seek out an agent? Or do you make recommendations, even if you don't have them in-house, do you make recommendations to a potential client and say, I usually use this lawyer, real estate lawyer, and these, you know, I've gotten good results. Here's some recommendations. Or you say to the client, you find out this person on your own, just for all for the liability reasons. Very, very good point and very good questions. Two things. I do not encourage, I don't like, let me just rephrase it. I don't like the idea mm -hmm. of having all the service on the one roof. Okay. Conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the real, real estate company is giving the loan, meaning not the realtor itself, but say one of those, I don't want to call names, but you have some real estate companies that are, they have a banking arm. Right. So they're lending, giving the mortgage. So they find it, they have the real estate arm and they're referring you to their bank financing bank. arm to get the loan. And they also have an arm that do valuations and they're right. doing surveying or they're controlling your transaction in too many areas. Right. I believe there is conflict. And I think it works against what the Fair Trading Commission stands for. Mm -hmm. I believe I prefer to stick to what I do. So the other part of the question is, yes, I believe we are the best persons to recommend okay. the value. I believe we're the, we're, not, we're the best persons to recommend the surveyor and recommend attorneys. For example, I have been in the business for so many years. I, I know the real estate attorneys who specialize in convincing, who do real estate law, who, who are unquestionable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, I, what I don't tell the seller who to use. I'll give you a short list. So I'll send you some names, email contacts, and you, the seller, will contact these attorneys, interview them, have a conversation and see who you feel most comfortable with. So I'm not going to tell you, use that one because she's my friend or 
or he's my friend. I'm not going to do that. But I do have a short list of attorneys that I would recommend to my, especially overseas clients, who I know they have the time. They have lawyers and you know, court lawyers. You can't find them. They're always in court. They're really criminal lawyers. And, and so they're doing a little real estate transaction, yes, but the client can't find them. They're good lawyers. But you need to use a lawyer who, this is what they do. Real estate convincing matters is what I, it's my main thing. And I'm available, or if, I, if I'm not available, I have a team in my office who, who is dealing with these, pushing these transactions through and not, um, you can't find. I, I have lawyers who I can't find, you know what I mean? I have lawyers who I can WhatsApp, you know, it depends on who you're working with. So I would recommend you to a short list of valuers. Right. I'll recommend you to a short list of surveyors. I will recommend you to a short list of lenders. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you which lender to use. Some lenders give different interest rate, different, some will charge commitment fees, some will waive the commitment fee. It's for you to have that conversation, mm -hmm. see which one suits you best based on your needs. So we realtors should recommend, yes, and you should ask us for the recommendation, free of cost, right? But um, we shouldn't be pushing and say, oh, use this lawyer. I, I wouldn't be doing that with any client. As a broker, do you mm -hmm. find yourself representing buyer, both buyer and seller? Strangely in Jamaica, <laughs> uh, it happens, but we're not charging the buyers. Strangely in Jamaica, realtors don't charge buyers a commission. It's free. Huh. Yes. But if you are representing it, the, the buyer, I mean, the seller. Yeah, because, because it, it is a, it's a matter of how we have practiced over the years. It's like in... In the US, for example, you can have the buyer's agent, buyers paying their agent. Um, we pay the buyer's agent out of the commission. So we charge five. Say I'm, I list a place and Polo Bank have found the buyer. So we're working together in the transaction. Polo Bank will send me their invoice. I pay them. Well, I guess the same thing works in the US too. It, it works. But um, we don't, a buyer don't come to us and say, oh, I'm going to pay you to find me a property. They can do, but we don't find that it is done in practice. So oh. oftentimes we're dealing with transactions where this commission is paid by the seller mm -hmm. and the service to the buyer is free. I may list a place and I may end up finding the buyer. Mm -hmm. And it's a strange situation because I am now working a transaction where the buyer is my client, mm -hmm. the seller is also my client, but it is the seller who's paying me. Right. And it's yeah, that, that dual role is allowed, but is it common in Jamaica? I think it's it's common, and I, but how what I think we look at it is that we're just trying to get the sale closed. We're not. You see, because unlike the U.S., where remember we have in our in our circumstances here, the buyer has an attorney. Mm -hmm. Um, we're not the realtors in Jamaica are not closing the sale. We are not closing a sale. It's a, We're it's facilitating a sale. Mm -hmm. the, the actual transaction process is being handled by the attorneys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're not preparing a contract. For example, I'm not preparing a sale agreement in my office. I'm instructing the seller's attorney to, to give it, given the particulars of the transaction. Mm -hmm. Buyer is this, seller is that, sale price is this. This is the term and condition. And the lawyer now is preparing the contract. And so the two attorneys are the ones doing the contract, you know? To suit their both clients, their mutual clients. So in that way, I would say we're not involved in the legal aspect of the transaction. We're just doing the realtor duty, which is to sell the property. In, in the US, the realtor prepares a contract. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. That's a little difference here. So that's how we look at it. I appreciate your here. time so much. And I know um, I, I don't want to keep you over because we're, we're a little over an hour. But this is so good, good stuff and the way that you explain it. Um, do you teach, um, Carleen, do you teach real estate school? Not at the moment. I just, I just coach my agents. Oh. You think I should? You think I should? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, you should. Actually, you should. Okay. Um, okay. And that's one, uh, another thing, too. I'm wondering how do you... One second, one second, one second. Let me call you back in here, friends. I'm still on a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, sorry about that. How do um, real estate agents then, you know, get their training? Because I know you said they have to go to real estate school. So I'm, I'm sure these are not offered through um, government institutions. Like, you know, it's more through private um, kind of set up coaching type of institutions. Yeah. They, well, well, as an interesting question, and let, so let me just advise, they, the real estate board, mm -hmm. which is our licensing authority, Right. They have what you call the real estate institute. So they provide the real estate course. And it and is that, government? Um, it's government? It's, it's, it's it government, right? yes. Yes. It's, okay. it's an executive agency, but it's government. Right. So the executive agency meaning that they pay for themselves. They're not under the kind of confuse it with how government work. But anyway, let's <laughs> it's, <laughs> an, it's an R, it's a licensing authority for us, right? Right. So they established the real estate institute. It used to be at UTEC. Oh, so it, it used to be housed in a in a in a higher ed. It used to be at the University of Technology, but they have taken it over completely. Okay. Through okay. the real estate institute, right? So they offer the real estate course. So all the real estate courses, whether it is for salesman, dealer, CPDs or whatnot, they are offered at that institute and they give you the exam and they also you make the application and they license you and all of that because we now have what you call cpds my license cannot be renewed if i don't do a certain number of hours of mm -hmm. um continuing professional education units okay right. right so all of us agents and brokers have to do cpds to keep our license to keep us current with what is happening and so on yeah. And, and so we have we have private we have lawyers, realtor, realtor dealers, and architects, and depending on what the subject matter is, valuers who offer training on those courses. And they are um, only located in Kingston. So what about the rest of Jamaica? Like even people in in Westmoreland. You can do by Zoom. You can do by Zoom. Oh, okay. And how long is this process? A realtor in Florida, a realtor in Florida who wants to get their license here, they can do the course online. Oh, that's interesting. So, so of course, in overseas in the US or wherever Canada can be licensed in Jamaica if they take Jamaica, it. yes, yes. That's interesting. All you need to do is show that you have when you make the application, show you have your currently licensed wherever you are, Canada, um, US. And what they will let you do, uh, they will you'll be exempt from certain aspects of the course because you would have covered already certain things. So the 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 land law section you'll have to do things that are specific to Jamaica that you need to know to get your license here. They let you do that part of the course, and you get your license. So we have a lot of persons who are licensed both in Jamaica and the US here, and they can practice anywhere they want. I know you have to go, but I have one question. I forgot this. Mm -hmm. People who are undocumented overseas, meaning, you know, people leave Jamaica and overstay in another country for whatever reason, and they can't leave to come to go to Jamaica to do any transaction of the sort. Does that, does that anything of the sort comes into the, the whole transaction? Because that may cause a fear for them to even want to talk about it, but do you even yeah. ask those questions like, well, can you come to Jamaica or any of this or anything like that comes up? No, we don't ask those questions. Um, whether or not you can come. In fact, you can you, we sell your house. You don't have to come here at all. Okay. You don't have to. You don't come. have to leave where you are to sell your house in Jamaica. You hmm, don't that's to. good to Documents know. are sent. No, do, you, paperwork. You prepare the paperwork and you send them. You can have a, a conference if the lawyer wants to talk to you, like we're talking now. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't care if you have travel documents or not, right? Well, what if it's the if other way around, around, where somebody wants to buy a property in Jamaica, but yet they're undocumented? Where you don't have to travel to Jamaica to buy a house either. As long as you provide us with the document that we ask for, which is to complete a CIF document, which is mm -hmm. a one-page document that doesn't ask you if you have travel documents, um, a valid ID, a government-issued ID, mm -hmm. and it could be a copy of a passport that is not expired, mm -hmm. and your TRN, which will help you to apply for if you don't have one, you know? Okay. Um, as long as you have that and a proof of address to show that you're your light bill or your water or your utility bill, some utility bill that for the address you save your living, 
That's mm -hmm. all we ask for. So I don't care if you can trouble Jamaica or not. What you will do if you're buying, you probably ask relatives here to come and look at the properties on your behalf. Mm -hmm. They could do a video call with you. They could do a video to send to you. Yeah. And you, the, doc, the offer documents are sent to you. You are the one filling out those forms and sending them back agreeing to buy. So, um, and you don't have to, the sale can close and you don't have to be here. Your lender is not even asking you to come here either. So you don't have to, lenders send you documents, you fill them out, you sign them, you send them back. As long as you're satisfied that your income can cover your mortgage, that you're, all of that, you provide them with proper documents, it doesn't matter. Um, you can do transactions anywhere you are and we don't care if you have travel documents. Because so you, travel document is for immigration purposes. But you can be employed and have a job letter. You can you can have what it takes. You can have a proper ID mm -hmm. and you can do your transactions. Let me tell you something, Carleen. Sometimes these questions, basic because you're in the position and have the experience, see very simple and not important. But you'd be surprised people ask these questions because they have so much fear and anxiety inside them. And we don't know um, the, the information that they want. It's not just easily or readily, readily available to them. And that's why these questions are asked. So what if AI can't go home? What if this? What if, and, and the other question that I get um, often too is what if this person who is, you, you know, people have busy lives, especially overseas, wants to use a local agent, meaning a person who is going to sign documents for them? A power of attorney. You can you can give somebody a power of attorney. Right. Um, yes. Specifically so, to do that transaction for you. Yes. And complete all the transaction, meaning yes. they, they, yes. Uh, um, a letter is sent and say this person is allowed to do it. How would you verify? Not a letter. I call it a power. It has to be a power of attorney. Do you verify? It's a legal document called a power of attorney. How do you verify that, um, Carly? It's a, it's a legal a document that is prepared by an attorney. Okay. that you would sign to say that you are asking that person to deal with this transaction. Specifically, it has to state what are the powers that you are being given. Um, because is it that you're just, the power of attorney is specific to this transaction or the general power of attorney where you can do anything on the person's behalf? So that the lawyer who is, okay. or we, we have to know what are the powers that you have from this client. Right. To do what? What are they extending to, you know, to what, what you can and do? And so that power of attorney, the, the, the lawyer would have to be in the own, own city or wherever the person lives. And yes. then it, it's sent, and, um, sent to you. Right. And okay. it has to be notarized and properly done. Yeah. All right. Carleen Sinclair. Mm -hmm. But if you come up with any other question, sure, you can. We can yes. Again. <laughs> Thank you so I'm much for your time. Yeah, I know it's very, very, very important. I don't want you to lose millions on this one hour. <laughs> no, no, and I, and I do. Let me tell you why I do it. Because overseas international clients are very important to what we yes. do. Yes, yes. And I recognize, when you reached out to me, I recognize the need because we find almost every international client we're dealing with, Jamaicans, yeah, who are returning home, they, we have to spend the time to talk with them because just make them feel comfortable. First of all, they need to trust you. Jamaica is a low trust society. Yes. And they have to trust you. They have to have, they need to understand what it is that you're asking them to do. Right. So any opportunity I get to help to make them understand and to make them more comfortable and provide the information that they need, I am willing to do it. It doesn't matter if they're going to come to me and do a real estate deal or not. Mm -hmm. It is our industry and they are important to Jamaica. The diaspora is larger than Jamaica. Yes. And so, right? and, and, larger than, and so I can tell you during COVID, most of my transactions are from overseas clients. Oh, wow. And we did very well during COVID. Those two years when people locked down, my phone locked up ring and we sold properties to overseas clients. Well, congratulations. So we, thank you, we thank them for that. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, yes, it is needed. And, and during this time, I, I think around this time, the Jamaica diaspora through the embassy and so on, always, whether they're in Canada, they do these um, info sessions. And I noticed that there's never, they, they do have real estate people trying to sell homes. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of having this session, like, tell, you know, giving the breakdown, um, more like a teaching session then or a coaching session. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. not available. So I thank you. 
I thank you're you. Welcome. And hopefully with this video and this information, your phone start ringing even more. Okay. <laughs> I hope and, so. um, anytime you, you know, anything new that's happening in the market and you want to share more information, please reach out to me and then okay. we can do another Zoom session. Carlin Sinclair, right. one of the uh, highest, biggest, <laughs> most, most real estate uh, broker in, ja <laughs> in Jamaica. <laughs> Um, she just provides us with a ton of knowledge about what to do when you're selling. Thank you so much, Carlene. You're welcome. My pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.